tell me a bit about your background, first of all, and how you ended up joining Insulate Britain. Yeah, so I'm a student. I'm studying mechanical engineering. Um, for a long time, I've been worried about the climate crisis. Uh, I was full. I had climate anxiety for a few years before this, and I felt completely powerless to the way was the world was going. Our generation, I feel, was betrayed by our government by its by their inaction, and I felt like action was necessary. So, uh, bearing in mind, according to the chief chief scientific advisor of the government, we only have three three to four years to act on this crisis. I felt that Interstate Britain is the only way we can get the change we need in the time frame we need it. Okay. And when you told your mum and dad, I guess your family, that you were going to be doing this sort of action, disrupting lives, you know, gluing your hands down in motorways, risking your life, and also possibly ending up in prison, did they tell you to not do it? What did they say? Yeah, they were terrified. They didn't want to see me get arrested a bunch of times. They didn't want to see me go to prison. But they understand the stakes here are higher than any one of us. They understand if the if we succeed and the eight to 30,000 lives a year that are currently lost to fuel poverty are saved, that's absolutely worth me going to prison. How did you find that experience? What was it like? Well, talk to me about the moment that sort of sticks out in your memory the most for good reasons, for bad, a moment when you were really scared, just the thing that's really, really lodged in your brain from, from all of that action. Um, whatever that may be. Yeah, it was really stressful, to be honest, going out sometimes three times a week, getting arrested that many times and having to deal with angry public that many times. I mean, they were absolutely justified in their anger. We were messing up their days. But I remember one time uh, on one of the blocks, I was, uh, I believe it was by Wandsworth Bridge, I was picked up and thrown out of the road over 20 times in 10 minutes. And I was absolutely covered in bruises after that. Um, and even after that, I, I took a day off, but I still went back to the road two days later because what happens to us is ultimately less important than what happens to the planet. And if we don't act, then the climate crisis will doom us all. There have been some instances of, of violence and aggression from members of the public I've seen it for my own eyes you obviously experienced it yourself how do you feel about the people who threatened to run you over who picked you up and roughed you up and shoved you to the side how do you actually feel about them well when we take this action we accept whatever comes our way because of it i accept that those people we did mess up their days and they have a right to be angry at us and i don't appreciate their responses but i can't criticize them for them you won't criticize them you don't judge them more no, I don't think done. we can. Okay. Would you apologise to them, to yeah, the public? I apologise to everybody that we've inconvenienced during this campaign. We don't like inconveniencing the public. That's the biggest turn-off that we have of doing this, is we don't like messing around normal working-class people just trying to get on with their lives. But if doing so can save thousands of lives a year, then we'll keep doing it. Talk to me about how you felt the moment you heard the judge hand down the sentence, the confirmation, you knew it was coming, but the confirmation that you were going to prison. I was honestly terrified. I knew it was going to happen for a while, or I was expecting it, would, it was a possible outcome. But as soon as I heard the words, it finally, I guess, kicked in that I was actually going to prison. And I was, yeah, I don't know. I was without words. I was that scared. What were you scared of, most of all? Well, I was scared of being away from my friends and family and everybody I love. I was, uh, I guess, I was scared of the people in there. I didn't know what it was going to be like. And I was scared I wasn't going to be treated very well. And can I ask, how was it in the end? How were you treated? It was actually quite manageable. The people in there were lovely. A lot of the prisoners, they all understood why we were doing it. They, they were actually quite empathetic, especially because... A lot of them are from working class backgrounds and a lot of them have experienced fuel poverty themselves. And so they're absolutely understanding that we need to take action to solve this and the government is go isn't going to act unless pushed to it. OK, so when you, you told the prisoners what you were in for, what were their typical reactions? I imagine there was a varied mix, but... Most of them found it quite entertaining. They don't get a lot of protesters, so they saw it was... Uh, yeah, I guess it was interesting for them because we're not in there for the regular things. And how did you feel 
that first night describe it to me describe your situation and describe that moment where you realized that you had lost your freedom yeah yeah so i arrived at the prison the first guards who searched you uh they were trying to intimidate us it was quite scary and then we were moved to uh, eventually everything takes ages to happen in prison so over a few hours they finally moved us to the cells we were going to be staying in and the first like uh prisoners on the wing we saw uh said to us they'd heard what we were in for and that they supported what we were doing and that they'd make sure our time in prison was okay really they said that to you <laughs> yeah yeah How which really you... put me at ease because i was quite nervous about the reaction from the other prisoners until that point so were you all together all you and the other certainly the men in in your group who'd been well, at the at the start but they split us up quickly uh they moved us around uh just split us up I'm not really sure why we were split up a lot faster than most prisoners usually are. Uh I don't know if there was pressure on the prison to do so or what. Okay. But generally speaking you didn't have any problems from from the other prisoners which had been your fear. No, I had no problems. I was so I was so surprised that before going to prison I was terrified at this point I would be perfectly willing to risk prison if the stakes were high enough. So this is your experience of prison has made you willing to go again. My experience of prison has emboldened me to take any future action regardless of if prison is a consequence. And would you go again? Will you go again with Insulate Britain? Well, I'm not uh too sure what's happening with Insulate Britain at the moment. Um we're still waiting on a response from the government, but I absolutely won't back down from taking future action uh whatever comes up, I guess. So if Insulate Britain say to you we're going again on the 1st of March, we're going to be on the M25. We're going to breach the injunction. Are you with us? What would you say? I'd be there, yeah. Even though you've just you've been in prison. Absolutely. Okay. I feel that if we're able to save these eight thousand to thirty thousand lives every year that are lost to fuel poverty, I would spend the rest of my life in prison for that. Okay. And on that note, the government reaction. How do you feel about what the government has done so far? Policy. The only policy that really has changed is making life tougher for protesters, is giving police more powers and making it easier to put people like you, I guess, in prison in the future. How do you feel about that as a success mechanism, as it were? Well, absolutely. I feel the government has betrayed its people by this. Uh, you know, civil disobedience is a cornerstone of democracy and it's or civil resistance, I should say, is a cornerstone of democracy. And time and time again, it's worked for social change it got women the vote it did so many other great things and i guess the by the government putting these new laws in they are threatening the very thing that keeps our democracy moving forward how do you see your future now at the start we talked about your student what you went to uni to study and what you wanted to do with it obviously you now have a criminal record how do you see your future? How has your future plans changed because of all this? Well, um, I very much doubt I'm going to be able to go into an engineering firm at this point. Um, so, honestly, my future to me matters less than the results from this campaign. I'd be willing to throw away any future that I had. And I did. I have thrown away my future by doing this. However, I'd be willing to do it all over again if it could save all those lives. At the moment, the government is uh, failing to meet 80% of its climate targets. And until it starts meeting all its targets, I'll keep going. And if it doesn't work, insulate Britain's actions of disrupting roads, if they do start again, will you see escalation as the only option? Will you take it further? Absolutely, I will. I see the only way that these protests will stop is when our demands are met when the government acts on the climate crisis, acts on fuel poverty and stands up for its own people. You've said that you're prepared to go to prison for the rest of your life. What are you prepared to do? You know, there's, there's one thing disrupting people, but if you're talking about escalation, what level are you prepared to act in terms of civil disobedience if, if the government continue to not listen to you? What is the next escalation? I don't know what the next escalation is, but whatever it is, it's going to be non-violent. I can promise you that. But... I, not even I know what the future holds. We'll see. Okay. And there'll be a lot of people listening to this 
really quite confused. You know how the public views insulate Britain. And actually, I'd like to, to ask you about that on, on how, how it feels to sort of be at the heart of that with so many people aware of what you're doing and also so many people really hating it at the same time. How does that feel to you personally? Well, we knew from the start we weren't going to be popular. I've lost trends over this. I'll continue to lose trends for my further actions. And that's one of the things we all accept when we start doing this stuff is that the results are so much more important than whatever we lose along the way. And, okay, I think that's it. Yeah. What has been the best part for you being part of Insulate Britain since, since the whole process started? The best part, the community. I've never felt more supported in my life. Um, the people around me are always taking the best care of me they can. And in prison, I've never felt more supported. I was getting letters from people thanking me for what I've done and it really helped me through it. What was the condition like in prison? You mentioned at the start the guards trying to intimidate you and clearly the other prisoners themselves have, you say looked out for you or certainly said that they would make life easy for you. Is that a fair assessment? Well they did what they could. We were on 23 hour lock up at the start and once uh, lockdown came in we were on 23 and a half hours in a cell. So I mean that's unpleasant no matter how nice the people are. Um, the guards, basically there weren't enough of them. It was quite an underfunded prison, so they didn't have enough people to take care of us as well as we may have liked, but they did what they could. Okay. And what did you do with your time while you were locked down in your cell? Um, I was thinking about, I was reflecting on the campaign and my part in it, and I was thinking about, uh, what's going to happen in the future. And I was, uh... I spent quite a lot of time dwelling on what happened at COP, uh, the targets that our government set, which would uh, make us reach, even if they met all of their targets, which they won't, we would reach 2.4 degrees of warming, and the government is legally obliged to stay under 1.5 degrees, and yet they set these targets anyway. There'll be a lot of people listening to this quite confused, I touched on this earlier, but you know, you're a young man with your whole life ahead of you, why is it that this is a what is it about this issue that has so inflamed you to the point that you're prepared to to risk your future and to disrupt so many people because we don't have the future that a lot of people perceive the climate crisis is going to make the future very very difficult for my generation people will die there'll be food shortages there'll be floods there'll be tornadoes there'll be absolute catastrophes all over the world we're talking a billion refugees by 2050. And I don't want to see my generation have to go through that. And if acting now and losing myself the possibility of a stable future in the next decade or so, uh, then I'm all right giving that up if it will protect the future of my generation over a longer time period. What about the people who say that you guys are doing more damage to the climate campaign. Plenty of politicians who are campaigners on climate issues say that actually actions like yours just infuriate the public to the point that they don't want anything to do with climate campaigners. They don't care about it as an issue. What's your response to that? Well, I'd say to them, nothing we have done until this point has worked. For 30 years, we've been protesting with every other method we've tried. There hasn't been a single result seen, not one. Well, there have, there have been results. They might not be to the extent that you want, but this is an issue. We have had things like COP. Governments have around the world entered into to binding agreements. Whether or not you think that's enough, I think is you know up for discussion. And I know there'll be plenty of opinions that you have and others, but things have changed in the past 30 years. It's gone from being a non-issue that no one ever knew really about or wanted to know about to a pressing issue. So things have changed, they're just not happening quickly enough. Well, yeah, well, absolutely they're not happening quickly enough. COP was a greenwash. They went in there with the intention of looking like they were acting on the climate crisis, and they set targets they don't expect to reach. They haven't set any ways of actually reaching those targets. They're just blind goals with no ways to get there. And these targets are still insufficient. If With these targets, if they're met, which they won't be, thousands and thousands and millions and millions will die. 